Today, our presenter is Peter Pinchot. I'd like to thank our Department of Environmental Conservation, his Professor of Forestry and Hydrology, and his song, there he is, Paul Barton, <laughs> for introducing me to Mr. Pinchot last summer. And I'm certain you'll find today's lecture most appropriate as it addresses both the natural and the built environment. Mr. Pinchot continued the family tradition related to forestry and wood products, a tradition begun by his grandfather, Gifford Pinchot, when in 1905 he was named the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service. Mr. Pinchot is CEO and co-founder of Whole Forest. Whole Forest is a sustainable forestry and wood product company operating in the coastal rainforest of Ecuador. Whole Forest aids Ecuadorian forest communities in managing and protecting their endangered forests, and in doing so, it's instrumental in building a vibrant local economy based on sustainable forestry practices. Whole Forest mission is reducing tropical deforestation emissions with the goal of developing and offering focus on reducing the net embodied carbon of building products and then exporting to the U.S. green building market, providing a significant carbon offset to our AEC industry. This is an incredibly timely presentation as it underscores our industry's movement to include reduction of embodied carbon as well as continuing on with operational energy and carbon reductions. Thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me to come here and speak today, and thank you for coming to, to hear this, this presentation. Um, I think I can skip the first part of this because you did a wonderful job, okay. Carl. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to talk about whole forest, but it's going to come at the end as a case study of a much larger set of ideas. And uh, what you see up there is one of our hardwood floors in a yoga studio in Pennsylvania. I'm not going to get to that until much later. Uh, I'm going to focus on five three themes in this presentation regarding how we manage forests and building design to reduce climate change. First, we're entering climate freefall. And we need to start drawing down carbon from the atmosphere, in addition to reducing emissions in every way possible. Second, embodied carbon, the carbon emissions, which you know well, generated by manufacturing building materials is a source of 11% of carbon emissions. We need to rapidly decarbonize the materials we use in new buildings and renovations. An emerging solution is based on sourcing building materials made from wood and agricultural waste, which turns the building into a carbon sink. Third, there is a very large opportunity to reduce global warming by addressing tropical deforestation and by restoring forest and degraded forest landscapes. These two strategies can almost double the role the forests currently play in moderating climate change. Fourth, though it sounds counterintuitive, but you probably know it here, creating a strong forest products economy raises the value of forests and provides a strong incentive for forest conservation. This occurred in the United States and Canada in the last century, and I'll provide a case study of applying this model in the tropical forest of Ecuador. Lastly, Old Forest is innovating a new strategy to reduce inviting carbon we provide tropical hybrid products. I think Carl already said this. Source from the forest that are, we are protecting from deforestation. And by maintaining a large carbon sink in the forest and implementing sustainable forestry practices, we can provide a large certified carbon offset. So this graph summarizes a lot of what we need to know about climate change. It's about carbon sources and sinks. Fossil fuels are the primary source of emissions. And sinks are where carbon is stored after it's been captured from the atmosphere. If you take a look at the graph, you see that the, starting off in 1750 to 280 parts per million, we look at the impact of the, of the fossil fuels with coal, oil, gas, and cement, which is not a fossil fuel, but it emits a lot of carbon. These are the major drivers of anthropogenic fossil fuel related emissions. Then we come to the, the very strong role of the, the land use, which produces a large amount of emissions from deforestation, but produces a larger 
amount of sequestration from the biosphere fixing carbon. So if we look at that whole cycle, that defines the balance of carbon. And when this was done in, in 2012, it was, it was 393, but now we know it's 419 parts per million. So this whole graph is based on the contributions of parts per million of different sources. European colonists, my ancestors, settled and claimed land in this continent that was already heavily populated by indigenous tribes and nations. Indigenous cultures have lived in this continent for many thousands of years without pushing the climate out of balance or driving other species to extinction. We, the European colonists, met the Native Americans with genocide, land theft, and the attempt to eradicate their culture. That is a large part of our origin story. Now, after several centuries of converting forests and grasslands into commodity-producing supply chains, and more recently mining fossil fuels to power our society, we're facing global warming and biodiversity collapse, both of which threaten the future of our civilization. Probably most of us participating in this event are engaged in one way or another in addressing climate change. Many of us are focused on technologies, uh, of, many of us are focusing on technologies and efficiencies that will incrementally make a difference. But it is critical, in addition to focusing on technological solutions, that we remember that there is no lasting sustainability without advancing social justice. The climate change and biodiversity crisis both have their origins in the commodification of nature through lumbering, agriculture, fisheries, and mining. This was only possible through theft of indigenous land and enslavement of indigenous Africans. To restore the planet, we must also restore the rights and agencies of indigenous communities. Our family settled in eastern Pennsylvania in 1818 in the village of Milford along the Delaware River. 75 years earlier, the sons of William Penn initiated the walking purchase of a large tract of forest land north of Philadelphia. They swindled the Delaware tribe that had inhabited this region for many generations to an agreement to purchase an area which a person could walk around in a day and a half, and then instructing a runner to double the area of that land. By the time our family settled in Milford, which was part of the Walton Purchase, the Delaware tribe was long gone. But old growth forests still dominated the landscape, a remnant of the indigenous low impact management. This pattern of coercion, land theft, and at times military genocide removed most of the indigenous populations from the eastern continent. Currently, there are few, if any, federally recognized tribal lands east of the Mississippi and south of the Great Lakes. That is how we created an empty landscape, a wilderness open for settlement. When our family settled in the Upper Delaware, in the Upper Delaware watershed in Pennsylvania, the original forest was largely intact. My great-great-grandfather, Cyril, settled in the village of, Mer of Milford and established a dry goods store in town. He also began a business in purchasing blocks of forest land and cutting the timber and sending log, log grass down the Delaware to the spring high water. The lumber was used to construct timber frame buildings in Philadelphia and Trent, New Jersey. Think for a moment about the carbon footprint of the buildings that were sourcing the lumber for building, for building in Philadelphia. The Northeast Pennsylvania forests were being cleared and were emitting thousands of tons of CO2. The carbon legacy of deforestation was writ large in the embodied carbon of these buildings. Wood may be a renewable resource, but where it comes from matters. In the early 1800s, during frontier settlement, clearing forests for agriculture was essential for creating a local economy. There was no economic justification for sustaining forests. Timber supplied the primary fuel for heating houses, for steam engines, and it was used to produce charcoal to smelt iron for timbers and coal mines and for building construction. There was no plan for restoring forests for future tim timber supply. The limitation of clearing forests was access to markets for wood, the first transportation provided by log racks and rivers. This changed dramatically with the advent of railroads. Then timber could be transported long distances to markets for construction materials and fuel. Okay. These slides show the progress of deforestation in the United States. With settlement, the whole east coast was eastern of the Mississippi was largely forested. And by uh, and uh, by the time we got to 2020, well over 90% of the original forest had been cleared. 
At first, clearing was largely for expanding agriculture, but in the 1860s, the rapid expansion of railroads made forests accessible to markets. Small spur railroads off the main lines were built by logging companies to make it possible to log most regions in the Appalachian and Ozark forests. The epoch of forest exploitation and clearing left a clear mark in the rising concentrations of carbon in the atmosphere. Long before fossil fuels became dominant source of carbon emissions, land use change was the dominant source of emissions. There was no period when all the land was cleared for us. In many years, with poor soils unsuitable for agriculture, the land was abandoned and started to revert to forests. This next slide shows the much slower progress of deforestation and clearing land for agriculture in Europe, which started with the settlement in 1000 BC. With no fossil fuel energy and little transportation of heavy materials, clearing forests tracked with a slow growing population and expanding agriculture of almost, over almost 3,000 years. By 1850, when deforestation was accelerated in the US, only the Arctic boreal forests remained in Scandinavia and Siberia. European forest clearing also caused large carbon emissions long before the loss of the old growth forests of North America. This graph shows the relative impact of land use change emissions largely from deforestation compared to the emissions generated from burning coal, oil, and natural gas. The gray area is the emissions from deforestation and agriculture. The black is emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels. The red line shows the percentage of emissions generated by fossil fuels. The horizontal blue line defines when the fossil fuel burning reached 50% of all emissions, which didn't occur until around 1910. Land use emissions through the early 1900s were largely produced by clearing temperate forests. Then rapid population growth in the tropical region caused a rapid expansion of agriculture, and tropical deforestation became the dominant source of land use emissions. So the bottom line is about 30% of the carbon emissions that are driving climate change now came from deforestation and not from burning fossil fuels. So forests matter. My grandfather, Gifford Pinchot, which we'll get to the slide here in a minute, was trained in forestry in France and Germany and became the first forester in the United States. After a brief practice in forestry as a forestry consultant, he started working for what became the U.S. Forest Service. Working under President Teddy Roosevelt, he helped the agency develop a plan to prevent the rapid deforestation of western forests. The Roosevelt administration brought, 100, brought 193 million acres of forests and grasslands into the national forest system, 10% of, of the U.S. continent. The objective was to manage the forest for a sustainable supply of timber now and to protect the ecosystems for a supply of resources for future generations. The Forest Service also invested in research and innovations in forestry, wood products, and supply chains to connect the forest to markets. During the 20th century, eastern forests were regenerated naturally <coughs> and through forest plantations. By the turn of the century, 60%, just last century, 60% of the eastern continent supported forests. These were secondary forests, rapidly growing and storing, storing more carbon than they were emitting. As the forest grew, a forest products industry emerged based on continual regeneration of forest after timber was harvested. Forestry and wood product manufacturing have become a major part of rural economies in many regions. In 2018, forestry-related businesses supported 2.9 million employees with 55 billion in wages. Forest landowners mean $10 billion in timber sales. This is an important lesson to bring to the tropics for the primary soil forests are lost. Most of you are probably familiar with the, the graph on the left. Do you mind if I do not wear this when I'm sitting up here with this? It would make it much easier, and I don't fart on my glasses. <laughs> so you're probably familiar with the graph on the left, which shows major sources of climate change emissions. Uh, on the right slide? I don't think so. I think I flipped one. Go back to this. Here we go. This is a familiar carbon concentration curve in the, in the atmosphere. I personalize this to remind me of what has happened in a few short generations. 1820, when our family settled in Pennsylvania, 285 parts per million in the atmosphere. 1964, I was a freshman in college at the University of California, San Diego. Roger Avell, who established the atmospheric 
carbon dioxide monitoring station in Mauna Loa was provost at UCSD and was promoting awareness of global climate change. And now, we're willing to make the necessary changes that we've known for at least 60 years were actually essential to do. So most of you are probably familiar with the graph on the left, which shows major sources of climate change emissions. The shocking reality that emerged when this breakdown of emissions was proposed by the International Energy Agency and the World Green Building Council is that the built environment is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, 39%. The second new understanding is that operating energy, built heating, cooling, and electrical loads, is not the only source of emissions from buildings. The fossil fuel energy used in all stages of providing building materials is also one of the largest sources of emissions, with 11% of 2019 emissions. Body carbon includes all the carbon emissions produced by mining raw materials, <coughs> manufacturing building, pro building material products, and transporting them to the building site. On the right is the role of tropical deforestation and forest degradation by unsustainable timber harvest, which causes somewhere between 8 and 10 percent of all emissions. By the way, when people talk about emissions, they're, they're not all adding all the emissions in. I think buildings are probably less than that. And forests are probably also less or more, I don't know, but this, I don't think we've ever had a, a good graph that shows all the emission sources from land and from, uh, from the forest. We'll explore a sustainable supply chain for wood products based on climate smart forestry practices that conserve and restore tropical forests and provide a carbon credit for the buildings to specify the products. Next slide. This is the IPCC graph that shows several potential emissions reduction pathways that can result in stabilizing the climate at 1.5 centigrade. Each pathway requires significant carbon storage to remove enough carbon uh, to remain at 1.5 after 2050. The conclusion is that we need not only reduce emissions, but we also need to remove a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere and secure it in long-term carbon sinks. Proposed <clears throat> goals to build new carbon sinks fall in two categories. Biological sinks that store carbon in vegetation, soils, and wood or agricultural products, and geological sinks that store carbon in deep rock strata. I'll focus on the biological sinks in forest agriculture and buildings that become an important part of the sink to slow climate change. Next, please. <clears throat> These are the calls for action by the IPCC in architecture for. 2030 and the American Institute of Architects, I'm sure you know these. The IPCC goal is to, by 2030, a 45% reduction below 2010 levels. By 2050, net zero emissions. Architecture 2030 follows on that. By 2030, all new buildings and major renovations should be carbon neutral. By 2050, all buildings will be net carbon zero. That includes the buildings that already exist. By 2030, 65% reduction in embodied carbon emissions, and by 2040, zero embodied carbon emissions. All of these are really tough, tough goals. And two things are true. It's hard to imagine they could be accomplished, and it's hard to imagine what will happen if they're not accomplished. That means they must be good goals. Okay, <clears throat> this is a study of all U.S. bars and the different sinks in which the carbon is stored. Leaves through photosynthesis absorb CO2 in the atmosphere and convert it into biomass tissue of the trunk, the branches, and the roots. Together they hold the above ground biomass holds 26% of the threshold carbon, 5% is in the roots, 11% is in dead wood and litter on the forest floor, and 54% is in soil organic matter. Very relevant to our conversation, 4% <clears throat> of the forest biomass has been converted into wood products and buildings. Our use of wood building materials has created a new type of biological carbon sink. It is important to understand that this biogenic carbon is sequestered by the forest, and the forest has to be well managed to act as a carbon sink. <clears throat> Forests that have been degraded by unsustainable timber management are carbon emissions sources, not sinks. Next. This slide adds the emissions uh, flows in the forest. On the right, leaf litter and deadwood are decomposed or are burned and become carbon, carbon emission sources. On the left, some of the leaf litter is converted into organic carbon in the soil, adding to the soil sink. 
In addition to photosynthesis, capturing CO2 and converting it into biomass, all plants emit carbon dioxide, dioxide through respiration as they metabolize sugars to grow. The key lesson is that all biological systems are both carbon sinks and sources of carbon emissions. In general, natural biological systems absorb more carbon slightly than they emit. When we source raw materials from forests and agricultural landscapes, we need to consider that unsustainable management converts natural systems into carbon sources. Thus, sustainable ecosystem management forced on enhancing carbon sinks is critical to reducing ne negative carbon building materials. This is not yet <coughs> included in, in the lifestyle cycle analysis. These are some of the key strategies that, uh, to reduce operating emissions from heating, cooling, lighting, and electrical loads, airtight building envelopes, air handling systems to provide fresh air, extra insulation, high performance windows, and ornate buildings to maximize solar gain. Insulation, high performance windows, air handling systems, and sealants for the building can, in some cases, <clears throat> add significantly to embodied carbon emissions and lead in. Uh, and load in high efficiency green buildings. This fact is one of the factors that is accelerating interest in sourcing low carbon and negative carbon biogenic building materials. <coughs> Next. This study by the Methune Architecture Firm in Seattle shows something about a carbon hotspots in mobile story buildings. Some of these components <coughs> are good candidates for substituting biogenic materials instead of using high emissions traditional materials. For instance, <clears throat> Mass timber and wood framing can replace steel and concrete as structural components. Wood fiber and agricultural waste can replace insulation made from foam and fiberglass. Wood and agricultural fiber can be used to make modular panels that can replace sheetrock and synthetic sealant tiles. And hardwood and bamboo flooring can replace synthetic carpeting. These biogenic genetic building materials can help reduce embodied carbon and in some cases can create a large carbon sink in new buildings and in renovation products, projects. Next. Over the last several years, there's been a rapid development of embodied carbon tools, barrication systems, and digital platforms. The goal is to integrate all building materials into an assessment of the whole building embodied carbon loading. At the center of this is the life cycle analysis, which evaluates the carbon impact during each stage of a product from mining raw materials to the end of life in the building. This is a highly technical analysis based on ISO standards with the goal of being able to evaluate the carbon impact of each building material and integrate these into a whole building and body carbon impact. In most cases, the life cycle analysis focuses on fossil fuel emissions generated during the first four stages, A1 to A4. Harvesting the raw material, transplanting it to a factory, manufacturing the products, and transporting the product to the building site. This is called cradle to gate. A more thorough analysis adds building construction and use, and then end of life with waste, and with waste disposal. This is called cradle to grave. And the final stage, cradle to cradle, includes the recycling of the materials. Material slashing have a very large impact on the body carbon of the whole building. This graph is from a study by Davis Landon of AECOM in England, based on analyzing 20 nine buildings and identifying the highest, lowest, and average product emissions for that, that category. The stu study demonstrates the dramatic difference in embodied carbon emissions between different materials used in building products that serve the same function. This suggests a large opportunity to make significant reductions in embodied carbon through careful selection of building materials. One key choice is whether to source building materials, materials that incorporate biogenic carbon which can store carbon in the building. Next slide, please. This was an embodied carbon analysis carried out by the English firm Rambol for selecting mass timber versus a concrete and steel structure. As a life cycle analysis found that timber would result in roughly one third of the concrete and steel emissions just in the processing it, and a A1 to A4 part of the life cycle analysis. That was a major reduction by itself. But when including a temporary storage of biogenic carbon in mass timber during the lifespan of the building, mass timber had a large negative impact on the building structure. Negative impact in terms of negative carbon. The building was constructed 
finally with Mass Timber. A caveat. He was landed in the analysis on the last uh, slide, commented about the sustainability of carbon stored wood products. He said, however, this is subject to sustainable sourcing. If a timber product is from deforestation, then its impact is completely different than if it was sourced from a sustainably managed forest. Think back for a moment to the logs our family sent down to Delaware that went into the Philadelphia house. No carbon benefit there. This graph was a result of a study of biogenic building materials at Edinburgh University. It shows the life cycle analysis emissions of common biogenic materials. And the orange size color is the, uh, the, the fossil fuel emissions, and in the blue side is the temporary carbon storage, only until the end of life of the building, unless the materials are recycled into a new structure. It's important to understand that there is considerable discussion about how to integrate biogenic carbon into life cycle assessment analysis. Currently, environmental product declarations do not allow counting biogenic carbon storage in their reports. It can be added as a separate benefit described in the EPD. We are early in the evolution of defining the role of biogenic carbon in reducing climate emissions from buildings. Next. Modsell in England manufactures modular wall panels that integrate straw, timber, and wood fiber in structural panels. This is an advanced example of integrating agricultural and forest materials into building products that incorporate biogenic carbon in buildings. I would argue that biogenic carbon is not a fungible commodity. It matters where it comes from. The primary actor in carbon capture and storage is photosynthesis by the forest or agricultural vegetation. If the farm or forest is losing carbon from the sinks, there should be no harvest. Man should focus on raising the biomass and soil carbon to mitigate climate change. This suggests that the life cycle analysis should expand its boundary of study to include the land ecosystem that is sequestering a biogenic carbon. In the future, we may see a biogenic product certification program analogous to Forest Stewardship Council for forestry and timber products to claim a climate impact in the building material, the raw material, forest or farm, would be certified to demonstrate a positive carbon impact from the whole value chain of forest or farm to product. Next. <clears throat> this is a crude concept of how we might expand the LCA for biogenic product to include the carbon dynamics of the land ecosystem for the sequester of the carbon. As with FSC certification, in addition to measuring the ecological management of the land, the valuation might also include other key impacts of sourcing materials from the land, including impacts to biodiversity and benefits to rural communities that are stakeholders to the land. A key recommendation for the future is to adopt carbon certification of the land that is sourcing biogenic carbon. There's a well-developed certification for determining the verified number of tons of carbon reduced or protected by forestry or agricultural projects. Certification already addresses the temporary nature of carbon sinks, so it would be directly applicable to biogenic storage of buildings. We're, we are using this type of carbon certification at whole forest. Next. Okay, now we're going to switch from products to forests once again. I'll never stop being a forester. Uh, forests are the most efficient known technology for carbon capture and storage. They're ready to operate at scale right now. They exist in every continent. Global forests are currently removing about 17% of all carbon emissions. As we'll discuss, the ability of global forests can probably be doubled with good forest management. A lot of R&D and investment is being made in geoengineering to mitigate climate change, such as capturing carbon out of the air, blocking solar radiation, fertilizing the ocean, and so on. We should encourage and support this R&D, but if few of these technologies have been tested and none are ready to operate at scale, the role of forests will certainly not be adequate to solve the climate change problem. But forests can bend down the emissions curve in the next two decades if we begin implementing aggressive carbon management soon. This will provide time for geoengineering strategies to be developed, tested, and scaled up. Next slide. We mostly think of western forests, California, Oregon, and Washington, with their drought and wildfires as a climate disaster. They must be net emitters, right? You see them in all the pictures. However, these forests are actually capturing and sequestering much more carbon than they're emitting, despite wildfires and insect damage. 
This study is of the Pacific Forest of, of California, Oregon, and Washington. The net ecosystem production on the left is the carbon, carbon storage through biomass growth minus the emissions from decomposition of dead wood and litter. That's clearly a, a negative carbon, minus 291 million tons of carbon dioxide being pulled out of the atmosphere every year. This is much larger than the carbon emissions from wildfires and timber harvest at 81 million tons. These kinds of forests are a powerful force for carbon capture and storage and for providing timber for building materials, by energy, and perhaps the most important role of providing water for agriculture and public water supply. However, there are some areas within those states where the fire and insect damage is causing the forest to be sources of emissions. At the larger landscape scale, there are major carbon sinks. This is the general case for most temperate secondary forests and forest plantations, and it provides a context for wood frame structures and mass timber in North America and Europe. Next slide. This slide shows the current carbon balance and the sources of, and sinks that create this balance based on the period from 2010 to 2019. Fossil fuels are causing 86% of emissions, deforestation and agriculture, 14% of emissions. The sinks, when we don't want to be a sink, atmosphere is taking up 46%, which is driving up the, the CO2 uh, concentrations. Forests in the biosphere are pulling out 31%. You subtract the 14% that forests are emitting, and you get the 17% net help that the forests in the biosphere are doing to reduce carbon emissions. The ocean takes up the rest. Without the role of forests and the whole biosphere, we'd be in much deeper trouble with climate change than we are right now. Next slide. This map shows where the highest levels of forest carbon are located, largely in the tropics, which is between the two yellow lines. The largest carbon sinks are in the Amazon basin in Latin America, in the Congo region of Africa, and in Southeast Asia. There is no pathway to 1.5 or 2.0 See cap on global warming if we continue to lose tropical forests and deforestation and exploitative timber harvest. We cannot have a repeat in the tropics of what happened in Europe and the United States, almost complete deforestation. There's just too much carbon in the forest that will blow us way past those numbers. Tropical forests also support over 60% of threshold species, many of which are threatened and critically endangered. And tropical forests are home or a subsistence resource for 1.5 billion people including a large portion of tropical indigenous communities. This map developed by World Resource Institute shows the primary sources of tree mortality in different forest regions, the boreal, temperate, and tropical. The three regions have dramatically different forest carbon profiles. In boreal forest to the far north, wildfire in brown color is the largest source of tree death through natural fires. The majority of the carbon in these systems is in the soil. In the southern boreal and temperate forest, green color, the original forest was cleared and has been replaced by secondary forest or plantations, which is growing rapidly and in general is capturing more carbon than it's emitting, even with a sustainable timber harvest. This forest region is a source of softwood timber, or structural timber and mass timber. In the tropical zone, the yellow and red areas, Tree mortality is primarily from conversion of the forest to agriculture and other non-forest land uses, such as mining. Yellow indicates small-scale agriculture, and red is commodity agriculture, such as beef cattle, soybeans, and African oil palm, largest of the global food markets. Agricultural expansion in the tropical forest is a source of 8 to 10 percent of global carbon emissions. Conversely, addressing tropical deforestation is a very large opportunity for carbon capture and storage through climate smart forestry, which reverses deforestation and restores healthy forests. Next slide. Referring back to the Architecture 2030 goals, there's this in 2014 at the UN Climate Conference in New York, the New York Declaration on Forest was adopted. <coughs> to address the uncontrolled land emissions generated by tropical deforestation and forest degradation. The declaration stated in a parallel set of goals, by 2030, a 50% reduction in deforestation. By 2050, 100% reduction. By 2030, 
restore 350 million hectares of degraded landscapes and forest lands. This is the blueprint analogous to green building, analogous to decarbonizing energy. We have to do all three simultaneously if we want to address climate change. Yes, how can we translate these goals into practical interventions, and what kinds of carbon impacts will they achieve? In 2017, researchers at the Nature Conservancy and several national and international universities released a seminal report called Natural Climate Solutions. If you haven't read this, it's really required reading. This paper analyzed an array of strategies to reduce forestry and agricultural emissions in the tropics and to strengthen biological carbon sinks. The study focused on low-cost opportunities that could make a big difference without waiting for large-scale financial commitments. This is a brief overview of the findings separated by continent, Latin America, and <coughs> Asia, and by carbon impact. The biggest impact, uh, well, the these impacts, by the way, are in teragrams, and that is roughly equivalent to gigatons, which is a billion tons of CO2. And as a reference to the, these numbers, total global annual emissions are about 55 gigatons, or 55 teragrams. The biggest opportunities in tropical forests are avoided deforestation, reforestation, and establishing trees in agricultural lands, agroforestry, also improved forest management. The premise of the study is to start out with the low-cost innovations, and then as carbon prices rise, start implementing the harder, higher-cost interventions. This could result in net emissions uh, by six gigatons per year, not immediately, but when it starts getting into gear and increasing the net role of forest to reducing 27% of emissions, rather than 17% now. This, is, this opportunity is not being talked about enough. It is, it is one of the top ways we can make a big difference to, to the climate change in a relatively short period of time. The key idea of natural climate solutions is these forestry interventions are relatively low cost and can be implemented and scaled up in the next decade giving us the opportunity to gain the political will to invest in a much more expensive clean tech infrastructure to get energy on track to meeting the 2015 zero part, uh, target. One of the encouraging trends in this last year is the rapid growth of interest and investment in natural climate solution practices, especially in controlling deforestation and restoring tropical forests. There are multiple investment funds with hundreds of millions of dollars looking for forestry projects that can incorporate these practices and provide a reasonable economic return. Climate risk has become a clear financial risk for many corporations and institutional investors. We believe there is a major business opportunity to implement a forestry model based on tropical hardwood products that parallels the evolution of sustainable forestry and wood product supply chains in temperate forests. And that leads us to a case study with whole forest. Whole forest operates in a small group of forest communities in Ecuador. And we're looking out from the, the forest behind us over the community and out into the agricultural landscape that has replaced the forest over the last 30 years. Uh, we operate in a small group of forest communities in Ecuador. And we manufacture hardwood products in the community based on the wood we harvest sustainably from the forest, which is owned by the communities. We're keeping it all home. A major difference between North American forestry and tropical forestry is that in the U.S., we had exploited and cleared our original forest before we developed a sustainable forest products industry. Rapid deforestation was only possible because we had driven the indigenous communities out of their forests and prairies and had created an empty landscape ripe for exploitation. In the tropics, in many regions, indigenous communities still occupy extensive areas of forest, but there's ongoing conflict between large timber and agricultural companies and the forest communities over the rights to the forest and mineral resources it holds. Whole Forest is a community forestry business with a focus on empowering communities to build a forest products economy that protects and manages forest. We're part of a global plan towards the devolution of forest governance to forest communities and strengthening their rights to the forest and its resources. This movement is based on understanding that forest communities are the most important stakeholders for conservation. Next. Whole forest operates in the northern coastal rainforest of Ecuador and one of the last remaining large blocks of this forest region. Until 50 years ago, the northern coastal rainforests were largely controlled by indigenous and Ecuadorian communities, and the forests were mostly intact. 
Ecuador's coastal plain is some of the best agricultural soils in the country, and it supported all growth forests that contain large quantities of valuable tree species, especially suited for plywood. Pressure from large-scale plywood and agricultural companies led to the creation of national concessions. The concessions took large parts of the land out of indigenous control and ceded the control to the companies, which implemented exploitative logging and cleared the land for industrial agriculture. The process was similar to the land theft in the U.S. in the 1700s and 1800s. Most of the original indigenous communities still exist, but they're now restricted to much smaller territories than they originally had, and are subject to road building and commercial logging and invasion by settlers. In Ecuador's Amazonian forest, indigenous communities still occupy a majority of the forest land. However, oil and mining companies have legal mineral rights and pose a direct threat to the communities. These images show a large galapagos northern coastal rainforest of Ecuador, about a million and a half acres, hectares, I mean. Green is forest and white is cleared land for agriculture. The yellow boundary is a 60,000 hectare conservation area. Whole forest is managed to prevent deforestation and restore degraded forest. Over 30 years, over 60% of the old growth forest in the larger landscape has been cleared and converted to agriculture. The total area of the image is about 1.5 million. Hectares, so about a million hectares of rainforest was lost in that period. In this landscape, the average amount of carbon stored in the biomass and soils is about 300 tons of CO2e per hectare. Assuming that two-thirds of the carbon is released through deforestation and conversion to agriculture, and the total emissions were about 200 million tons of CO2. Even a small area of deforestation has a significant impact on global climate change. Next slide. This is what deforestation, <clears throat> this is what Deforestation driven by large scale commodity agriculture looks like in Ecuador's coastal rainforest. Logging companies gain timber concessions from the Ecuadorian government, allowing them to drive native communities out of the forest, and they clear large blocks of old growth rainforest, taking the best species to make plywood and other wood products. And agricultural companies establish a large African oil plantation for global commodity markets. This is used to produce palm oil, it's used in many, many processed food and for cooking oil. On the left, a palm nursery is in the midst of a large palm plantation. Um, uh, forest plantations, no, that's actually on the right, sorry. Forest communities have a very hard time competing with large companies connected to international supply chains. Next, this is what deforestation driven by large scale commodity agriculture looks like in Ecuador, coastal rainforest. Log company, no. All forests began. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where are you? I've already done that one. Uh, well, anyway, I'll do this one by looking at it. Oh, yeah. All forests began as a non profit intervention funded by USAID in 2003 with the goal of helping forest communities develop a forest products economy, protect their forest. Illegal logging and clearing forests for small scale agriculture was the primary economic activity. We helped create a community forestry enterprise in the 60,000 hectare watershed that was in the midst of deforestation. <clears throat> Campesino farmers settled after a land reform. We're continuing to clear forests for cattle pasture and cacao and African oil plantations. We understood that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the best strategy to protect the forest was to raise the value of the forest by creating a forest, forestry and wood product economy. It, Emulated what occurred in the U.S. Uh, in, the, in terms of building a forest products company that benefits the forest communities. These images show the, the cycle of deforestation. This started, the first thing that happens is that a logging company builds a road into the intact rainforest. That immediately opens up the road to all the, the agricultural markets, the markets for, for timber. Then you get a, a rapid period of of illegal logging, it's illegal because Ecuador has very strict uh, forestry laws. Taking out the majority of the wood at that point has no value, so you knock the forest down and convert it to cattle pasture and then eventually into or straight into uh, plantations like African oil palm. Some of the uh, founders of the community enterprise on the upper left, Peace Corps volunteer, to a seminal role. He was my best friend and I came down to visit him and uh, asked him if I wanted to if he wanted me to ruin his Peace Corps lonely project, and he said yes. And I asked him that three times, and finally 
I accepted his third yes. And we started talking to community members about and laying some of the things that are being done here in New England with community forestry, with, with uh, cooperatives, and taking that and applying it in the Ecuadorian context. We knew very little about tropical forestry at that time. Um, upper right are the, the families of the 16 community founders of the enterprise who were uh, at, we now have a different business model which includes them as shareholders in the larger company which is run by uh, some professionals because the whole forestry supply chain is a little too complicated for Campesino farmers. Not that they aren't more intelligent than us and had much more knowledge, but they didn't know how to do marketing and all that kind of stuff. And down below was in 2015 our staff, who was over 100 this year. These staff members are held, paid well above minimum wage in Ecuador. They actually are up at the median level of income in the country. They're part of government, social security, and health care programs. And uh, they have get 15% profit share every year, mandated by the Ecuadorian government. We would do something like that, but that's what it's like when you're not living in the United States and you care about the poor. Uh, okay, next slide. We started off doing hard with managing the native forest. We set up a, a business model which would pay 60% higher prices to landowners for following the Ecuadorian Naval Harvest Plan, which meant they could only cut a smaller number of trees and leave them there. And, uh, and then we went into manufacturing wood products and selling to the local markets. We ran into two problems. One, community members were way smarter than we were. They happily took the 60% higher prices for the, <laughs> the legal wood and then continued harvesting the rest of the wood in order to keep on putting food in their mouths and sending their kids to high school. And secondly, uh, nobody in Ecuador wanted most of the species in the forest. There was over 300 species in these mega diverse forests. They wanted five of them, and only for very specific uses. So we failed once and we decided we had to do something that was going to succeed. So we took on planting balsa tree plantations, managing balsa tree plantations, and manufacturing balsa wood laminates that are used as the core material for creating wind turbine blades. They, they sit in between the, the layers of fiberglass along the foam and other parts of the blade. And so we quickly we could hire professionals who knew exactly how to deal with every aspect and we didn't have to reinvent the whole supply chain the way with, with hardwoods. And that, that business has carried us through for about 12 years. Um, and we got up to doing 250,000 board feet a month of products sent to China, Europe, and the United States. So it became a viable business. So how do you come into a community setting? In this case, we're the Capucino community members were farmers and they expected to knock down their forest and create agriculture and convince them to keep their forest there. What kind of benefit can we get and we can hire some of them, but how do you deal with the landowners? What we've evolved is a system of doing 20 year lease contracts where the farm, farmer families still own their land, the parts that are already cleared, they continue doing agriculture, the parts that are forest, we manage for, for sustainable forestry, for restoration and for timber harvest. Uh, so that upper right is a typical family. We're going in there and developing a management plan with them. Uh, on the lower part of this, we have to do intensive silvicultural studies. We also have to learn how to avoid building roads. How do you get the wood out of the forest without building a road? We don't have any idea how to do that in the United States. We always put the road first and then do the harvest. You will build a road into a tropical forest and it's gone. So we had to develop, next slide, a system using portable sawmills small diameter cables. They go back up into the forest, eight kilometers or more, and go from ridgetop to ridgetop, pulling out mill wood down to a road or to the river. The other big thing about managing tropical forests is the incredible biodiversity. We have globally critically endangered species that are in the forest that we're managing. For instance, the coastal spider market, one of the 26 most endangered primates in the world. And we're going in there to manage timber harvest. That's wacky, right? Well, what's wackier than that is converting that land into, into agriculture, which is the alternative. So th this is th these are some of the issues you have to deal with. But definitely building roads does not work well. Right? 
So now we get down to the design issue. We've got 300 species. We want to harvest at least 60 of those, which we can do sustainably, ecologically. We know the regeneration patterns. We know how to, how to manage that forest and the resource. The other, other 240 are beyond our understanding at this point, so we're not going to harvest them. But you want to sell products that are in the relative abundance of the species you have in the forest. We can't go off and do three containers of one species. Just you can't do that in tropical forests. Well, you can if you have an extensive area and you're going to destroy the forest. But if you're going to manage it long haul, we have to make products that incorporate dozens of species into their products. So we make hybrid products, and we no product has less than seven or eight species. Some of them have 15 or more species in the same product, and we let the the biodiversity be our palette for how we design. Next slide. Uh, upper left was at the International Contemporary Furniture Fair uh, 2019. It may have been the last in-person uh, trade show. <laughs> we used to go to a lot of trade shows. Looking forward to that again. Uh, that gives you an idea of the, the range of things we do. Wall panels, tables, countertops, flooring, uh, anything we can make out of it's a surface product that we can make out of multiple species. And uh, one of the things we're working very hard on is the aesthetic, because not everybody likes bright, colorful things. So we're working to develop more engineered products where we can put some of the species that are less uh, quote unquote appealing on the bottom and middle layers and put uh, the, the ones that people like to see or in relatively similar uh, low contrast mixes on the top layer. We're working with stains, we're working with lots of different ways to, to develop uh, the aesthetics of it. And we're wide open to help with anybody here who'd like to get involved in that project. Next slide. Some more recent uh, uh, installations. We just hired a guy, I don't know how we found this guy. He comes from Oregon, he spent seven years in Ecuador. He's a design build person, so he knows everything about machines, he knows design, he knows how to talk to specifiers, etc. And he's living in the middle of a rainforest in Ecuador now, running our manufacturing facility. <laughs> and it's like just man from heaven. We were looking for a wood technologist, all over the place for a wood technologist, and we could get to work with it. We still need that. But this guy knows practical wood technology, and it's just been a godsend. So these are some of the recent products he's been uh, working and installing in various places in Ecuador. Okay, so we have a little area, 60,000 hectares. It's not all that little. It's about 125,000 acres, but it's little for biodiversity scale. So can we scale this thing? Is this, is this a viable conservation operation, or is this sort of a hippie uh, project, you know, brought up in a commune somewhere? Well, it's a combination of those two things. I probably, I used to be a dairy farmer, so I have a certain commune back in now. But it, we're looking at how do you scale this? We want to get up to a, a big enough scale so that we can start reducing emissions that have meaning. We're in collaboration with the Ecuadorian government, and the Seven Year Public Private Partnership is their Red Plus uh, partner for their nationally determined contribution under the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, we work with two bird conservation organizations. Um, we uh, are working with other nonprofits. And the idea is to bring enough partners in so you can start scaling up. And we're starting to work with both the Chachi indigenous communities. Uh, um, Chachi or straight up, well, it's, it says that, and, and then the Awa. The Awa just came to us recently and said, hey, we like what we hear about you, we want to start managing our forests again. They've done some really bad management early on, had bad experiences with logging companies and stuff, and so they, they're really interested in working with us. And that's what's happening. We've been there long enough now so that communities are starting to come to us to get trained and to enter into some sort of a commercial relationship. So we're hopeful that in the next few years we can start expanding the conservation impact to a much larger landscape. Uh, top is the Red Plus program, which is a UN program for controlling deforestation and forest degradation. We're definitely we're 
in that, that program and that diverse key team for doing that. We're in the process of getting FSC certification. We're also in the process of getting carbon certification of our forest emissions reductions. And then we want to work with the Athena Sustainable Building Materials on life cycle analysis and through two environmental product declarations. We would love it if the viral product declaration could include <laughs> negative carbon or biogenic carbon. I don't think it's going to do that yet. But we can list it and we can promote it. And if nothing else, it's a good story. Uh, so those are some of the things we're doing. Next slide. This is our, our carbon value proposition. And most importantly, that person, that little wonderful person on the right, is my granddaughter. Her mother is a forester who works for the US Forest Service, Eastern American chestnut, and, and uh, Dutch and elm tree, and also working on, on ash. Uh, so some traditions die hard. Mm -hmm.